Ghost with Cats, Chapter 1, Ghost Rider Underground Annalise Annie Wintersdove was a ghost writer. However, she preferred the term ghost reader because to her it felt like she was reading the novel from the author's mind through their notes and style. She liked to think of herself as a kind of magic pencil. For the last few years, she read every kind of espionage involved action adventure or mystery type novel into existence for her best friend's publishing house. She enjoyed her new life as much as she could for a person with crippling anxiety and PTSD. She could no longer be around people for more than an hour or three a day, just long enough to teach a college course, Writing 308, How to Be a Ghost Writer. As a natural mimic herself, Annie could intuitively see what the authors needed their characters to be in any plot situation. Translating notes, obscure plots, and abstract ideas into fiction reality was what made her so good at her previous job as an NSA field analyst and linguist when she wasn't helping her mother, renowned physicist Dr. Basha Winters Dove, as they tried to figure out what Basha called the Pandora frequency. That was until that Christmas, six years ago. Rule for ghostwriting number three. Do all your own research. And by 23, Annie already had, and she paid dearly for it. First week of November, on her flight to Denver, Colorado, from Lake Fork, Texas, a nervous Dr. Annie Winterstub reminded herself repeatedly she was on the plane as a favor to a friend of a friend. Her publisher, Sharon Cohensheim, recommended Annie to a fellow publishing agent, Walter, after an industry luncheon. The beleaguered agent and his chief editor had ranted for an hour about the miserable state of a new book and the delay and problems with the new ghostwriter, or professional co-writing assistant, as the incompetent man insisted on being called. The co-writing assistant had the book months behind the publishing deadline and it would not even be out for the upcoming Christmas season as promoted. They were desperately hoping for a New Year release, but the publishing agent lamented even that was impossible. The agent and editor were demanding he be fired, but the contract termination clause was flawed. The only thing the publishing company could do was wait to reassign him once the book was published. It would be the worst book in a 40-year collection of works. However, there was a loophole. If another ghostwriter from outside publishing, from an outside publisher rewrote the entire book and got it published before the New Year's deadline, they could pay his contract nullification fees and be free of the saboteur, and the contract would be voided. Walter begged the favor from Sharon, so she called Annie, who had just finished a modern Western and forensic mystery. Rule for ghostwriting number one. Read everything your writer ever wrote first. In a two-week binge before they met, Annie read everything the author had ever written in his 40-plus year career. Getting off the plane with nothing but a carry-on and her laptop bag, Annie was shocked at who met her at the airport. The author himself had come, not some assistant or lawyer. 
They spent the afternoon cruising through the Rocky Mountains in one of her new client's classic cars. Autumn was running late and mild in the Rockies, and mercifully, the wildfires had been few. Warm November sunshine brought the promise of December snows. He was gentle when talking to her after Sharon gave him the rules. But his passion and angst for his latest work shone in his eyes. Annie told him about her rules of ghostwriting and told him why she was qualified to read his book into existence. When she was an NSA analyst, Annie had been sent to offices all over the world as a translator, but also to analyze and solve problems post 9-11. Not surprisingly, Annie knew several of the same people as her new client, who was retired Navy intelligence and still a consultant for MORA, the Maritime, Oceanic, and Atmospheric Research Association. Some people's habits were singularly unique, and without dropping a single name, they discovered just how overlapped their associates were. For example, how many Basque expatriates ruin a perfectly good espresso by putting a drop of clove oil in it, or dipped his Costa Rican cigars in clove oil? only one. It was truly a small world they lived in. Both cringed as they laughed about it over coffees, watching the traffic and the golden aspens. Under the clapping golden flags of fall, Annie learned why he was gun-shy about taking on a new ghostwriter. His late son had been the best co-writer he'd had. His son's surprise death from a heart attack deeply hurt the author, who stopped publishing for over a year. This work was to be his return to the public, but the ghostwriter assigned to assist the elderly novelist was the most unprofessional Annie had ever heard of. Constantly arguing the plot and even altering the story to suit himself against the author's wishes. Pops, as the author insisted she call him, was bitter and frustrated, but he gave her one week to impress them for his old acquaintance's sake. Sitting in his mountain chalet, she listened to his recorded words, talked to him, and read his shaky, shakily scribbled notes for the three key chapters then amazed him five days later. It was like his son's ghost had come to help him in the form of the petite, doe-eyed woman with the odd habit of nibbling on her left knuckles while clicking a pen. Annie also sent co a copy of the chapters to their mutual publisher friends. Sharon and Walter beamed and said the work read as totally authentic. The editor was over the moon to have Annie on board and begged for a promise to meet the New Year's release date. Annie just smiled at them over Skype and told them, I am only writing the words between Pop's ideas in his voice. I'm just his magic pencil. Then she winked at them. They were laughing and reassured as the virtual meeting ended. Rule four for ghostwriting. Write everything in their voice as if you are reading it from one of their works. Pops offered to let Annie stay in his home in Evergreen, but Annie refused, knowing she would want to spend all her time talking to him instead of working. The next day, Sharon booked a long stay hotel on the western outskirts of Golden, Colorado, under her company's name where Annie settled in anonymously and began to read the new novel into existence. Rule one for a ghost. Be as invisible 
as possible. December. After a month of hard work and long days, Annie was almost finished ghost reading Pop's latest novel into existence. She loved being his magic pencil. It was an amazing concept and would be one of his best novels to date. Annie easily recognized the inconsistency the previous ghostwriter inserted as an attempt to discredit the aging author. She knew exactly who the other ghostwriter was after the third chapter. So she tossed his entire copy because putting the story back on track was easiest if she just started fresh. Annie and Edward had both taken volunteer or minimum pay assignments, teaching college courses for the National Novelist Guild, and they crossed paths too many times in the last four years for her to not recognize his style. The ghostwriter, or professional co-writing assistant, fancied himself the next Clancy or Kessler. He wasn't. She taught for students and as a part of her socialization therapy. Edward did it for the co-eds. He wanted to slap the 30-ish boy man and tell him to go back to writing sports porn for men's adult magazines or get a steady girlfriend, or both, after seeing the mess he made of a potentially award-winning novel. Anna remembered once she wished he would drive his Kawasaki under a truck after overhearing his latest contest, conquest, crying in the women's lavatory. Miss Dove, as her students called her, took the distraught girl to the course advisors and insisted the girl be transferred into her class from his. She also warned the faculty advisor about his taste for young co-eds. When they didn't listen, Annie anonymously left a note on all student dating boards about his philandering past and then prayed for nothing worse to happen. However, later that summer, two different girls had a screaming match outside his evening class, this time involving the police. The university discovered he was having inappropriate contact with more than half his female students, and he was dismissed for the remainder of the summer session. Annie pushed down her anxiety and topped both glasses so the students wouldn't suffer for his cavalier, man ways. Edward confronted her at the next national convention during the volunteer teaching coordination meeting, only two short weeks later, and then began her real problems with him. Between speakers, Annie met with the Novelist Guild representative. I will no longer teach on the same campus as him. I have no tolerance for predatory men. Are you tattling on me like you did at DCCCD? Edward snarled, interrupting. You did that to yourself and embarrassed the guild, Annie declared firmly. He yelled at her, drawing the attention of everyone in the room. You know it all, busybody bitch. What I do before or after my classes is my business. Dallas Community College was not the first time. Oh, really? What would a frigid frump like you know about anything? Edward menaced her by stepping close enough he was breathing on her face. But Annie didn't flinch. She knew exactly who she needed to be to bring him down. So she was. She calmly recited the schools and number of students he had seduced before calling him out in front of a hundred of their fellow writers and teachers. You are a manipulative predator, practically a rapist, and any, everyone who has worked on any campus with you knows it. 
I am just the only one who is not afraid to say it. The meeting went into lockdown, and during the next two hours, over a dozen other writers admitted having the same experience teaching on other campuses with him. The Novelist Guild president had no choice but to dismiss him from his teaching duties and the Novelist Guild for violating their code of ethics. It ruined him, but Annie showed no regret as she boldly faced him down with the truth and consequences of his selfish actions in front of their peers. No one from the Guild knew she had thrown up from the stress when she got back to her hotel room, or that she went back to her home to Lake Fork, Texas, and locked herself in her house for a solid month, suffering a relapse of her PTSD-related agoraphobia. A friend of hers visited from the NSA visited Edward at Sharon's request and politely informed him if he did not cease to threaten Annie, he would find himself in a Central American prison with no passport. The phone calls and the email threats stopped the next day, and she had not seen or heard from him until now. Working as rapidly as she could for the last month, Annie hoped she prevented the damage he tried to cause the great writer's reputation and legacy. It was almost like making the book the best it could be was as much for the man's sex victims as it was for the author. It felt like revenge as she wrote the story to the potential of the author's notes and words. She told Sharon and Walt to leave her name out of the contracts. She was doing it for personal reasons, not the money. And she told Walt to send her paycheck to a support hotline for victims of sexual assault. She knew as soon as the bastard read it, he would know which ghostwriter replaced him. She hoped he choked on his worthless word vomit. Sitting on the bed, she typed rapidly. Annie knew she only had a few days left to get the current draft done for Pops's publishing house to make the release date. She was excited to be ghost reading for one of her late father's favorite authors, and she wanted to make Pops and her late father proud.